No, then, Craig O. Um, I was reflecting earlier about our last conversation face to face, and it was um, when we met at the Hilton, St. George's Park. So, yeah. was, that, was that the back end of last year or the start of this year before the ice race? That was, it was the start of this year, start of 2020 of all years, um, just before I went off, went off to the Arctic. That's right. Yeah. We were talking a lot about some of the key themes and concepts around, obviously, the way you approach these sort of ultra ultra events i call them because you do more than sort of one one type of race don't you and obviously over the last 48 hours you've had a, a bit of a personal challenge yourself talk to us about that because i want to i want to set the scene for whoever stumbles across this video or what it is you did on saturday through to sunday well um the opportunity came up to do it was it was strange i'd signed up for a race to help a friend uh, which is quite unique. It's a race that doesn't have a finish line, doesn't have any checkpoints. You basically have a start point. You set off from the centre of England and you get as far as you can in 24 hours. So when I started to crunch the numbers and I was thinking, right, if I can maintain a certain pace, I could do 100 miles. And in theory. <laughs> so anyway, that, that, race, that actual race got cancelled and they brought out a new race called day release uh, and it's like a prison break theme where you run from your home and you run out as far as you can and back within 24 hours um, and I was still at this idea of 100 miles in my head and when I started to look at it all um, I thought maybe I can do 100 miles a year and um, and there's two things there there's two like pillars really of ultra running one is a hundred miler is like you know oh like you know it's something that a lot of ultra runners aspire to one day and it's certainly something i wanted to, to test myself against and try uh, and the other thing is to do hun doing 100 miles is one thing but doing 100 miles in 24 hours is a whole new challenge um now the other interesting aspect of this race was the, they measured the distance as the crow flies which meant you need an extremely straight course you know, um, so there was loads of little different aspects of it. And uh, so all in all, I completed 104 miles and 104.42 miles, um, which is just incredible. The, the, the interesting thing, scary thing, whichever way you want to you wanna pitch it, is that I think I can knock two hours off that. And uh, or I can put an extra 15, 16 miles on it. Which, which just blew my head. And I remember talking to you, like I said, same conversation, beginning of the year, and uh, thinking, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to really ever put in a decent effort for an ultra again. I don't know. You know, there's so many, like, unknowns, so many things that I was worried about and concerned about. Um, and to be sat here now, talking to you, reflecting on the year, is just, you know, it's just, just incredible. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a key point, because for me, from from my angle of coming in and supporting you and, and the other guys we work with, it, it's, it's so, so important to have those reflection moments in terms of not just looking back over the year and the conversations we've had in the past over the years, actually, but, you know, reflecting on what's just happened. So where are you at right now? So you've just run over hundred miles in 24 hours. And I, if I remember rightly, it was like lunchtime to lunchtime. So it was through the night, you know, to paint the picture. Is that right? Yeah, it was four o'clock in the afternoon. There was a couple of reasons why, um, there's there's a, a really famous ultra runner called Courtney DeWalter and female runner just you know it's just incredible and, and she said a couple of things in a video that I watched recently and it really st stuck out in my mind and one of them she shouted her husband was doing a race for once and she was helping him out and she shouted make good choices and it just it just sounded weird because it it's not like normal language is it make good choices you know what I mean make good decisions yeah. you know I, I don't know it just seemed weird and it just stuck in my mind. And um, because it stuck in my mind, I was like thinking, right, is this a good choice? Is it a good, cho you know, and I think I made, I made a lot of really good choices because, you know, people watching this should know that I, I, I'm an average runner at best, you know, um, I'm averagely consistent at, at best, I would say, in my training and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I, I know there's, there's some incredible elite runners out there that are constantly at it, but uh I'm not really like that. <laughs> so to you know to have done over 100 miles, it was it was huge, huge achievement for me. Oh, without a shadow of a doubt, it'll be a massive achievement for anyone for sure. And and I think when you 
when you play down your talents, you're talking about your physical physical ability there, but I think you you offset a lot of that regarding your your mental approach, which I want to touch on later on. But going back to this ability to reflect on performance and that, we're 48 hours on. Where are you at from a sort of physical and psychological position right now? Where where are you at? I don't think I've ever been in such a good spot after a, an event. Um, like like physically, you know, my my feet are pretty battered, um, but they're good. They're going to be repaired in in two or three days uh you know a couple of blisters and a few aches and pains and, and that kind of stuff just bruising you know after doing covering that kind of mileage i mean it's, it's a long way my wife came out to meet me halfway and it took her an hour and a half to drive from home to the turnaround point and that's driving you know um so it's a long way my 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 muscle aches and everything are, are not too bad Again, you know, in, I could probably manage a little trot today, certainly a walk or a short bike ride. Um, mentally, I've normally finished these events and I'm like, that's it, I've retired, no more, <laughs> you know, no more running. Um, I'm keen, I'm keen to get going again, you know, which again, when, when we had a conversation beginning of the year, a lot, a lot, I was questioning running and whether I enjoyed it anymore and, you know, how, how to find enjoyment on it. So many times I, I turned up and, oh, let's go back a bit. Before I even got to the start line, there's been so many times I've been chatting to you and I've called you and said, I'm underprepared, I'm not conditioned, I'm injured, I don't know how this is going to go, you know? This is the first time that I've ever, I've ever been on the start line thinking, I've no injuries, and all right, I could have dropped a stone, you know, to be a bit of a better weight, but conditioning wise, I'm actually, I'm actually, you know, pretty much, pretty much on target. So that was a big, a big, big moment for me, just realizing that. And, and how did that sort of, sort of lead into, you know, your, your psychological process during the run? What was the journey there? So you've arrived on the start line, you feel you're best prepared as you can. Um, and I think, you know, you're, you're not a natural lightweight runner like myself here, you. you know, you're not these, you know, eight, nine stone and, and arguably you probably never would be. Um, yeah. But psychologically, your journey through that, what, what was that then? So you've arrived in a good place. And then how, just, just break it down over the 24 hours for us. Yeah, it, it was weird, this race, in that there's, there's a couple of things that were naturally going to play in your mind psychologically. One is, <laughs> there's no prize. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm going to get a medal for running 45 miles as a crow fly. And I've run 104, 42. The other thing is that on the results, I think I've run the furthest distance, but I'm third in the overall standing because my route wasn't as straight as someone else's. So there's no like, there was no real skin in the game. I had no reason to do it, you know, and paid particularly a big amount of money to do it. Um, and that, that, so I could have, I could have dropped out at any time, really, you know. Uh, I did, I did kind of, that, I did think about that ahead of time, and I did. I did put a bit of like accountability and transparency in there um, by getting up with a couple of other people involved. And, you know, I thought, well, I've got to do, some, if they're going to go to all this effort, then I've got to, I've got to see this through. Um, the other thing was that uh, what, what makes it really hard is that you, you don't know how far to go. Like, you know, I wanted like a top, top five finish, maybe even a win for the, for the actual race. And, but you, you don't know how far to go because you don't know how far the next, you know, there's people out there doing the race. You don't know how far they're going, how straight their route is and all this kind of stuff. All you know is you've got to get out as far as you can and back in 24 hours. So mentally there's a couple of things that I did. First of all, you know, we've, all, we've talked before about the difference between, you know, like trying to, trying to will yourself through something and commitment. You know, I, I was, I was truly committed to it and it was getting done and, Quite often I'd say to myself, it doesn't have to be fast and it doesn't have to be pretty. It's just got to be done. I've got to do every step and uh, I might as well get on with it. Uh, and then the, the other thing that, um, that I, I, I constantly w was telling myself was that I was going to do a race out and a long walk back <laughs> was kind of my, my race strategy. And I, you know, I'd create a spreadsheet with all my little timings and, and all this kind of stuff and and uh, what I would do at certain places. And, and everything went really well. Um, 
do you want me to talk about some of the things that didn't go so well and, and then kind of how we got around that? Yeah, or... I think so. I think, yeah, it'd be quite enlightening, I think. Yeah, so so, so the route, uh, you'll know some of this route, basically from, from my home, I went past Cosford, RF Cosford Base. Um, and, and for the first sort of 15, 16 miles, it was on busy roads on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, it started to get dark. Big trucks sort of flying past you. You know, you've experienced this with your cycling. It's quite hair raising, like you know, when you just you're just a, a vulnerable body on the side of the road with however many tons of metal just shoot, you know, flying past you at six mile an hour. So you know that kind of takes its toll. But a lot of that was either flat or downhill. So I could really kind of just just get on with that and get that done. Now, when I first started, I, I was on for a four hour marathon, um, and I think back now and I'm like you know that that that's that's a ridiculous pace really um but i was feeling strong and the conditions were with me other than it was a bit misty it was it was great the temperature was good uh and that wasn't a problem it then had a, a stretch of about 20 miles on the Shropshire union canal and um i'd done a little bit of a recce on there a couple of weeks ago and it was it was fine but when i got here and when i got there on sort of saturday night it was just like a like a quagmire. It was just so wet, muddy, greasy. And um, it, it really sort of took its toll. It was really, really slippy and really slowed me down. Um, it was absolutely, absolutely pitch black and I had a, a head torch, but because of the mist and because of my breath, the light was just reflecting off the, off the mist. And I could, you know, I could, I could barely see. And at times I was better just running in the dark. Um, but then I made it really hard because I'm, I'm trying to keep my feet dry because I've got a hundred, you know, 80 odd miles to go or whatever. I'm trying to stay out the canals. I don't want to fall in. Um, and it, that was, that was quite a tough thing to, to, uh, to get through really. It's quite a tough time. And, you know, I did think about our conversations a lot of like, you know, what can you control, you know, the, and, and, and the thing that I could control was um, if I can get through in a decent time, then as soon as I get on the road, the, the, you know, I can I could probably recover a bit of time there. So all I need to do is just is just get through this this stage. Um, once I kind of popped off the road, I'd lost. I, I started off with that sort of four hour rough marathon. I, I'd started off. I had a, have a buffer of about forty minutes. Now I lost that on the canal, and I was I was over time. It was about ten minutes over the time. Um, I managed to I had a, like a like a a B. A plan B. If the canal was shocking, then I had a plan B and I could come off sort of two or three miles earlier and, and get on the road and try and make up a bit more time. But I decided I was going to do that. Um, and I had a, a great crew. I had two, two friends sort of helping me out. But on reflection, there's a couple of things that they did which just completely messed with my head. One was they weren't giving me accurate information. They were in an attempt to try and G me up and get me moving quicker or to make me feel better or whatever. They were telling me the distance was less than I was actually doing. And they was telling me that I needed to move faster than I was actually moving. So that, you know, they, they kind of really played on my mind a bit, you know, and, and kind of got me down a little bit. So I think if anybody's watching this and they, they help people in the future, you just got to be honest, you know what I mean? Just be honest so that the racer, the athlete or whatever can just make a decent decision and they kind of know where they are. Um, anyway, Got, got on the road and, and I was about, I don't know, I was about 10 miles from my anticipated turning around, turnaround point. Now I wanted to get to my turnaround point, which is about 52 miles um, in 10 hours. That was kind of my, my own personal cutoff. And that would give me you know, 14 hours to then have a long, more or less walk back. Uh, and it's quite obvious that it was, I wasn't going to get to my turnaround point in 10 hours. I was going to probably hit it around 10 and a half 10, 10 hours, 45. And I was really questioning whether I was going to get back in time. And obviously, if I don't get back in time, the race doesn't stand. Yes, I've covered the distance, but, you know, it really is for nothing then. Um, so I, I phoned I phoned guy, Andy, that was manning the checkpoints, and he was, like, feeding me and giving me water and everything. And uh, and he was like, no, nah, you'll be fine. You know, where, where, have you, where have you picked this 10 hours from? It's just, you know, it, it means nothing, really. It's just your decision. I was like, well, it does mean something because – you know, with fatigue and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I need to have a good 14 hours to get back really. And he said, look, just, you know, you kick yourself if you don't make it to the actual turnaround point. And uh, he basically said, you know, you're not, you're not turning around early, do it. 
So I put the put the phone down in a bit of a strop, and I was like, well, you know, I thought I thought you'd have understood and all this, and you didn't. And um, anyway, I, I kept on going, and, and at this point, the roads were really long, lights at the end of the road, and they, they just didn't seem to get any closer. And I was moving quite slow, uh, and I could I could hear a car coming up along uh, behind me. It really started to slow down. I thought, oh, and to top it off, I bet this is the police, and I bet I'm going to get bloody, you know, pulled over and all this. And I looked over to my left and it was my wife and my son. And, uh, and they brought a little puppy, Dotty, with them. And uh, it just absolutely picked me up. And to the point where, you know, they were driving alongside me and I was just trotting along. And it just helped me get through that low point. The circumstances can just completely change your mental, um, that way you are mentally and also how you are physically. You know, um, so basically I trotted all the way into the halfway point. Um, I felt I felt OK. I felt felt pretty fresh and obviously tired and legs were a bit battered and everything. But you knew I had 50 odd miles to go to get home and uh, and was ready for it. Um, the turnaround point, the turnaround was 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 pretty not, not a right lot to write home about, really. I mean, there weren't any mega disastrous moments um or like events there was there was a time when i was really feeling the pressure of time you know uh, and that was kind of on the way back i was halfway through the canal section again and um and, and i couldn't work out my maths isn't great anyway especially on the run having done 70 odd mile you just my maths just wasn't working and i'm trying to work out what pace i need to sustain in order to be able to get through you know, and come in under the 24 hours and I couldn't work it out. And um, I got to one of the checkpoints on the canal and, and same again, I said to one of the guys that was helping me out, you know, how far is it? And how, how, how many, uh, my, what, what pace do I need to go out? How many, how many uh, minutes per mile or whatever? And he said, you've got 31 miles and you, you could, you could walk it at three and a half mile an hour if you want. And I was like, ah, that, no, I mean, that's, that's almost a stroll. Um, anyway, luckily, I said to him, um, can you just send me a message with the distances from one leg to the next, just so I know what distances so I can get my head around it. So he sent me the distances and I went, well, that's not 31 miles. I told up and I'd done four miles before I got the text message and it still totaled 38 miles. So I was 42 miles to go and he told me it was 31, you know. So at that point, I was like, what the hell do I do you know now um, I'd also taken a wrong turning so on the way back from the turnaround point there was a bit where my, my brother was kind of driving alongside me for a couple of minutes and was chatting away seeing how I was doing a bit of filming with the GoPro and um, and I said I don't recognize any of this road are you sure this is the right way and he's like yeah 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 keep going keep going anyway I then get a phone call from Andy uh, the other guy in the support crew saying you know you're going the wrong way and we went you know a couple of miles off route um, I just had to just had to get on with it. Like you know, I couldn't turn around. You know, I had to kind of see it through. Um, but yeah, pretty pretty uneventful. And then uh, towards the end, I'd lined up a couple of runners to run with me. Um, one of the guys, because I was I was slightly behind time, he came and met me further up the canal, uh, and he kind of ran with me for a lot longer. And um, and that really helped. You know, he, he was kind of chatting away. I was, I didn't really say a great deal, but, um, you know, he just kept, kind of kept me moving. There was times when I would have walked, you know, if there had not been anyone else there watching, I think. And, uh, and he just, he just kept me moving. Um, my mantra became, if you want this bad enough, you'll make it happen. And, and that's just what I kept saying to myself, you know, and I was thinking, right, I need to run from this sign or from this lamppost or whatever. And, I really, you know, I didn't want to, it was hurting, it was in a lot of pain, but I just kept saying to myself, if I, if I want this bad enough, I'll make it happen. And it was almost like a, like a character um, judgment in it, you know, because if I didn't run at that point, it's like, we obviously don't want it then. Well, I do want it, I do want it, you know what I mean? So, uh, and that's kind of how I, I kind of made my way through. There was a couple of times when I got a little bit choked up when I, when I was thinking about, um, what what was about to happen I was getting towards the end and uh as I was when I got to Cosford that was there was 4.2 miles to go 
and, uh, and I'd worked out that if I got there by three o'clock, that's an hour to do 4.2 miles. And I could, you know, I could do that really, really easy. Uh, and I got there at half two. So loads of time in the bag. And then it was just a long stroll um, all the way, all the way to the finish. And obviously the finish wasn't immense because of social distance and all that, but I had some, you know, I had a bit of family there. A couple of the guys that run with me were there and, uh, and it was enough to make it a special occasion. And um yeah, just just incredible that I'd done 104.42 miles in 20 in less than 24 hours, and um, and it really was relatively uneventful. I mean, you know, I, I spoke to you before about some of the other races, and there's been times when I've been, you know, close to slipping into a coma and and all this kind of stuff, and it just wasn't anything like anything like that. So, and I think when when you, when you hold on to that last thought there, and you you link into the fact of all right, there's a bit of misinformation from your support crew. And yes, you, you took a wrong turn in. And, and yes, obviously, the, the, um, there's a bit of flooding on some of the towpaths there. Actually, compared to some of the other challenges you've had to overcome, not just in your running career, but your professional career beforehand, it, it, it's, it's negligible, isn't it? But in that moment, it's everything, isn't it? Because you're focused on your goal. Yeah. Oh, it is. It, is, it becomes, oh, it can become completely engulfing, you know? And, and I think, um, I, when you when you add that to the fact that, that like I'm, I'm not running for some prize money here, you know, there's no medal for for doing 100 miles. There, there's there's nothing like that. Um, there's just there's just no reason to carry on. So and when the wheels start to come off, you've got to find some some reason to carry on, you know. And and lots of people, I kind of worked it out halfway through the race. A lot of people said to me, "Why are you doing it?" <laughs> I was like. I don't really know. You know, I just got it into my head that I was going to do, I was going to try and do a hundred miles. And, um, and so, I, you know, so I'm doing it. And lots of people, when they start doing big races like that, they go, oh, we'll see how it goes. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't let myself say, I'll, I'll see how it goes. Cause it's just, you know, the way I'm looking at it is like, well, if it don't work out, then, oh, well, you know, I was only yeah. seeing how it goes anyway. No, I was doing it. You know, I'm going to do this, whatever. And I'd said to myself that, even if I'm way over time, I'm still going to do the hundred miles because that's that's the target I've set. The under twenty four hours is is uh, is something else. But halfway through the race, I kind of it clicked on me why this race was so important to me, and and I think it was because all the other race, the big races I've done before, I've been in the Sahara, the Amazon, you know, in the Arctic and all that, and you're quite detached. And people track you and they follow you online and all this kind of stuff, but you're quite detached from your family. They don't really know what you're going through, you know, you, you see when you come home and your feet are a bit battered and you've lost, you know, a stone in weight or whatever and, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff, but they, they don't really understand it. They don't really experience it. But for this race, like my wife was going to be at the finish line, you know, which meant that she's going to see, you know, she's going to see all this and then she's going to see me when I finished it. She's going to have a, a real understanding of the time that's elapsed because she drove the route she's going to have a real understanding of the distance that I've traveled. And I think, I think that was like one of my big driving forces was with, a, a, you know, people there that I really cared about. He's going to, are going to, you're going to get to witness it, you know, and going to get to see it. And I was fortunate that my oldest son who wo works away, he was, he was back as well. So he could, um, he could kind of see it. It makes, yeah. it makes it real, doesn't it? Cause I think, you know, anybody can sit down and watch your videos, you know, they're all over YouTube and, and I'd encourage anybody listening to, to look back at some of Craig's radios uh, videos. It's, it's fantastic. But when you're there experiencing it and, and seeing it, you know, how tired you are, how, you know, how achy you are, how sore you are, that really bring, brings it to life. And I, I really like that, that little message earlier around, you know, the, the lift you had from an external factor, which was obviously your wife, Paula and your son and, and even the puppy when you needed it most. And I think, there's a huge message there in terms of sometimes we can help and support people all the time, but sometimes they don't always need it. So, you know, if, if somebody running alongside you for the first 10 miles, when you're running at, you, you know, a good pace yourself and you're comfortable and you're running off adrenaline because you're getting started, hence your four hour marathon, that's not needed. That's not when you need it. It's, it's when you need it most. It's really important for people to be there. Yeah. And, and like I said, you know, and, and, and that coupled with, with honesty, you know, the, even when I got to Costa at the end, I had four and a bit miles to go. And um, the, the guys in the support crew said, right, you've got, you've got 50 minutes. I was like, what are you talking about, 50 minutes? And I'd lost all trust in what they were saying at this point. I said, what are you talking about, 50 minutes? It's half past two. 
my deadline's four o'clock and I've got four miles. Where where does 15 minutes? And they were just yeah. they were just trying to get me to go faster or it's quite I understand what they were doing. It's really common, Craig. So I mean, um, was it over 10 years ago now? I did the I was a support crew for the race across America for a team of four where they were doing 3,000 miles on the bikes and it was in seven days was their target or something. It was like ridiculous. So 15, 16 mile an hour for seven days. And um, we had like a crew chief, you know, who was allocated and um, we had a plan and the plan went out the window as they always do within the first few hours, things happen, you know. Yeah. And then other people start chirping up their ideas. And I do remember two people in the sport crew going, right, well, we need to make this time up, but don't tell them. Just, you know, tell them they're not going fast enough or, te- or, or creep the distance or lengthen the leg. And I was like, the last thing you do to an endurance athlete is start lying to, to unless yeah. it's part of your plan. You know, if you haven't preset that up and gone, I don't care what it is, I just need to know what my target is. I think that sense of realism and that honesty is so important because when somebody, if somebody give you all those statistics, when you were at your lowest ebb of that race, it could have broke you and it could have stopped you, you know, yeah. and it's on the verge of, of verge of that happening, where it's actually right. You are a little bit behind, but we've got a plan in place. So it's all that positive language we talk about. And this is how we're going to slowly creep it back. So, and you go, yeah, that feels right. Cause I'm not stupid. <laughs> I've done the plan and I know exactly where I am. And this person's on my side. Yeah. And, and other little things as well, which is just, it was just language, but I had a, a spreadsheet with, you know, this is the distance of leg. This is my anticipated pace. This is what time I should get there. And obviously when I first started, they were like, right, you're 40 minutes ahead. You know, you're 30 minutes ahead, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then I got to another checkpoint after the first leg of the canal. And they said, you, um, what was the actual words they said? You're down, they said, you, you're down 20 minutes. So in my head, I'm like, well, how have I lost an hour? Because I was up 40 minutes before. How, how have I lost an hour? And uh, I said, what do you mean? You know, I'm down 20 minutes. What, what's that? And I'm looking at my watch, and what time is it? What time was I supposed to be here and all this? And what they actually meant was, you've lost 20 minutes of your buffer. So I'm yeah. still ahead 20 minutes. You know, and it's just, it was just that little bit of clarity. And it wouldn't really matter on a day-to-day basis. But when you just turned out all your energy and ran, ran your bloody your tank dry, you know, and you're not thinking straight anyway. Um, there was a couple of points where my, my hearing just went. You know, just like, bing. I was like, can't hear all. There's probably, <laughs> you know? probably those juggernauts um, going past you under a mile an hour yeah. in the middle of the night. Yeah, exactly <laughs> what it is. exactly what it is. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it just, it's quite it just, common, and I think I think you know to be fair as well to the to your support crew. I think I have seen it in the past where people try and do it, and their intention is to try and help and support you out and motivate you and make sure you're staying on target. But I think there's a lot to do about knowing your athlete there. You know, a little bit of work around what works best for people. Um, but again, lesson learned moving forward. So talking about them, so every every experience is another opportunity to learn some lessons. Um, what was your main? What was your top three takeaways from from your experience over the weekend? Uh, top three takeaways. I think um, you know. I've not even I've not even really thought about. I suppose a personal one is that you know much more capable than you would have yourself believe, and uh, and quite often it just does boil down to that commitment. You know, saying you know this, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to see how it goes. You know, I'm I'm going to see this through. Um, you know, like I'm looking at it now and I'm thinking I can save time there. I can save time there. You know, some of the checkpoints was there much longer than it needed to be. Um, if the canal was in better conditions, you know, there's just a lot of, and I really think I could I could knock two hours off that. Um, or if you put it into distance, I could do an extra 15, you know, maybe looking at even 120, 125 miles in 24 hours. So, um, yeah, much, much more capable than you kind of think you are. But it's incredible how you your take on your own abilities changed. You know, when, when we first met, I'd lock, not long, I don't know if, if I'd just been to the Sahara or you're was just, just going, going or, just or going, yeah. You're just going, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, at the times then I was like, oh, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, to go and do that now, I just, I, I don't think I'd really change my training now. I think I'd do a couple of sessions in, my, in a heat chamber and get your kit right and then, you know, you're good. Uh, one big takeaway is is that 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 preparation and strategy, you know. And I did I did sort of strategize a lot. Um, 
probably too much in isolation. I should have probably just, you know, bounced it off a couple of people. What do you think? But, um, you know, to have the spreadsheet with the distances, having done a, you know, a recce of the different places and what I would do is, you know, there's a time when, when I come off the canal, right, I'm, I'm changing my socks, I'm changing my shoes. I'm changing, you know, when I get on the canal, I've got a different bag in case, you know, I get hurt. I've got some warm clothing in there and, and all this kind of stuff. And just those little bits of prep and having that strategy made made a massive difference. Um, I don't know how it would have gone down if I if I hadn't really thought about, about that kind of stuff. Uh, other takeaways, I suppose, another one was I took, I wish I could show you now, but I literally took big boxes of food and I, I tried to take variations of liquid food, variations of solid food, variations of um, savory food, variations of sweet food. And, um, and actually the amount of calories I consumed was very, very slim. You know, I didn't, I didn't really eat a great deal at all. Um, lots, lots of drinking, lots of like hydration salts and, and that kind of stuff, but not, not a lot of food really. Uh, and so it was, yeah, just in that respect, it was good to have it, but I didn't need it, you know, and could definitely keep it, keep it simple, keep it a lot more simple. Woods, um, you were talking about the mist as well, and it has been really sort of nice and cold and cool, hasn't it? But the mist in terms of visibility and, and, and tricks on your mind, that must have been difficult. So if you were to do it again and try and beat your record, and because you've, you've set a personal benchmark now, haven't you? Um, do you think you'd pick a different time of year maybe with longer sun hours or is there, is there a plan in place? Yeah, I didn't mind the I didn't mind the night. I didn't mind the dark. Uh, when you're running, it can become a bit of a lonely place because all you've got is this beam of light in front of you. Um, but on the same token, you know, I quite I quite like my own space, my own time, and to be with my own thoughts, even if they're really crap at the time. Um, so yeah, I think definitely a different time of year to firm up the ground, and that you know that would have made a a massive a massive difference. But then in some respects, you know. As, as that got a counter argument in that the, it would be much warmer, so therefore you need more water. Um, the, the ground would have definitely made a, a big difference. Big difference. Yeah, definitely. And then loads of room for improvement. So we've had a we've had a quick, quick sort of hot debrief there, reflection on, you know, there's only 48 hours since it happened and no doubt you'll have plenty more sort of light bulb moments over the next few days and weeks of, of, of whatever you're planning to do next and what you could do differently if, uh, if you were to... Uh, challenge a benchmark which knowing you you most definitely will be you've probably got an idea roughly in the back of your mind already so what's next then craig so what are you thinking is it time off for christmas put your feet up get the business up and running again and or is it just uh pipe and slippers doing nothing <laughs> um yeah lots lots going on with with work and business uh the usual stuff especially because we're about to reopen again after after lockdown um so that's quite busy uh physically I don't know. I don't know about December. I've got a couple of people that are asking me to, or encouraging me to get involved in their like December virtual challenges and all this kind of stuff, but nothing, nothing mega. Um, I've got some, I've got some challenges lined up for next year, including a summit at Mont Blanc, uh, uh, a couple of, a, another trip out to Kenya to do a big multi-day ultra out there. And a couple of other things that I'd, I'd like to do again, closer to home, there's a race that goes from the source of the River Severn all the way to the sea. And, um, and it passes my old house, you know, that was on the river there. And um, I'd quite like to do that because, again, it's, you know, it's right on the doorstep. It's in the UK. And, um, and then I've also got an aspiration to run the full length of the UK. So I don't know, we'll see. I don't, I'm not sure whether I'm going to do that next year or, or the year after or, or whatever. But, yeah, a couple of things. But I don't think I can ever can never really turn it off, you know? Um, I know I'm, I'm, I, how bizarre is that, though? Because our conversation in January was you were talking about you couldn't turn it on. <laughs> yeah. No, you can't well, turn it's it incredible. off. incredible. Well, that, I mean, you know, and it's a great little sort of afterburn, afterthought, in that, you know, every little bit of crap terrain on the canal or the hill or going wrong or whatever, or niggling your knee, you know, constantly saying this too will pass, this too will pass, you know what I mean? And, and knowing that it, it's going to go, there was a time when, you know, I, I vomited a couple of times and, um, and I was like, yeah, fair enough. I, I know what that is. It's just a bit of exhaustion and, and I'm working a bit too hard and um, it'll pass, you know? So, uh, yeah, that was definitely something that <laughs> played a big part. 
Well, just from a little bit of feedback from uh, external people, a few of my sort of friends and family are asking, what's Craig up to now? Why is he doing that? And I always give the same answer because he wants to and he can. And what a great way to wrap it up. Well, thanks, Craig. Thanks for great chat to you as always. And obviously we'll um, we'll hopefully catch up before Christmas, if not early into the new year, COVID dependent as always. Um, and we'll start putting some plans in place for, for your big events for next year. It's great to see you've got such ambitious goals, which probably after the experience you've you've put yourself through in the last 48 hours, maybe are not so ambitious now. Now you know that uh, <laughs> it's such a good, strong, yeah. strong person you are. So um, we're, if you've stumbled across this on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, guys, we've, we, in the comments, we'll stick all the links to myself and Craig. So Craig at, Craig at uh, getcraigwilliams.com and also Team Bootcamp. And also my, I'm Phil Kelly from an organization called Pronoctus. So we're going to have a look around our websites. Got some great content on there. We've both got podcasts. We've both got webinars. We've got some loads of stuff, vlogs, um, all talking around our personal journeys our organizational plans and uh, mindset and performance so hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you again soon cheers now thanks Bill.